Good evening, and welcome to Dr. Peace Theater. My name is Dr. Dennis Business. And tonight, tonight we are going to begin a new adventure, a new long walk, another hunt for the magic unicorn. But unlike those, this is going to be a difficult read and an even harder listen. The Inferno, part one of the Divine Comedy, by Dante Alighieri. Our main character, from what I can gather, was out and about doing what he did, staying on the true way, and something happened, and, and he lost the true way, and he woke up in a deep, dark forest, and that is where we will begin. Midway in our life's journey, I went astray from the straight road, and woke to find myself alone in a dark wood. How shall I say what wood that was? I never saw so drear, so rank, so arduous a wilderness. Its very memory gives a shape to fear. Death could scarce be more bitter than that place, but since it came to good, I will recount all that I found revealed there by God's grace. How I came to it, I cannot rightly say. So drugged and loose with sleep had I become when I first wandered there from the true way. But at the far end of that valley of evil, whose maze had sapped my heart full with fear, I found myself before a little hill and lifted up my eyes. Its shoulders glowed already with the sweet rays of that planet whose virtue leads men straight on every road and the shining strengthened me against the fright whose agony had racked the lake of my heart through all the terrors of that piteous night. Just as a swimmer, who with his last breath flounders ashore from perilous seas, might turn to memorize the wide water of his death, so did I turn, my soul still fugitive from death's surviving image, to stare down that past that none had ever left alive. And there I lay, to rest my heart's race till calm and breath returned to me. Then rose and pushed up that dead slope at such a pace, each footfall rose above the last. And lo, almost at the beginning of the rise I faced a spotted leopard, all tremor and flow and gaudy pelt. And it would not pass, but stood so blocking my every turn that time and time again I was on the verge of turning back to the wood. This fell at the first widening of the dawn, as the sun was climbing Aries with those stars that rode with him to light the new creation. Thus the holy hour and sweet season of commemoration did much to arm my fear of that bright murderous beast with their good omens. Yet not so much, but what I shook with dread at the sight of a great lion that broke upon me raging with hunger, its enormous head held high as if to strike a mortal terror into the very air and down his track a she-wolf drove upon me, a starved horror, ravening and wasted beyond all belief. She seemed a rack for avarice, gaunt and craving. Oh, many the souls she has brought to endless grief. She brought such a heaviness upon my spirit at sight of her savagery and desperation. I died from every hope of that high summit. And like a miser, eager in acquisition but desperate in self-reproach when fortune's wheel turns to the hour of his loss, all tears and attrition. I wavered back, and still the beast pursued, forcing herself bit by bit till I slid back into the sunless wood. And as I fell to my soul's ruin, a presence gathered before me on the discolored air, the figure of one who seemed hoarse, from long silence. At sight of him, in that friendless waste, I cried, Have pity on me, whatever thing you are, 
whether shade or living man? And it replied, Not man, though man I once was, and my blood was Lombard, both my parents Mantuan. I was born late, sub Julio, and bred in Rome, under Augustus, in the noon of the false and lying gods. I was a poet, and sang of old Anchises, noble son, who came to Rome after the burning of Troy. But you, why do you return to these distresses, instead of climbing that mountain of joy? Which is the seat, started again in three. At sight of him in that friendless waste I cried, Have pity on me, whatever thing you are, whether shade or living man. And it replied, Not man, though man I once was. And my blood was Lombard, both my parents Mantuan. I was born, though late, sub Julio, and bred in Rome under Augustus in the noon of the false and lying gods. I was a poet, and sang of old Anchises, noble son, who came to Rome after the burning of Troy. But you, why do you return to these distresses, instead of climbing that shining mountain of joy, which is the seat and first cause of man's bliss? Are you then that Virgil and that fountain of purest speech? My voice grew tremulous. Glory and light of poets, now may that zeal and love's apprenticeship that I poured out on your heroic verses serve me well. For you are my true master and first author, that soul maker whom I drew the breath of that sweet style whose measures have brought me honor. You see there, immortal sage, the beast I flee? For my soul's salvation, I beg you, guard me from her, for she has struck a mortal tremor through me. And he replied, seeing my soul in tears, He must go by another way. Who would escape this wilderness, for that mad beast that fleers before you suffers no man to pass. She tracks down all, kills all, and knows no glut, but feeding she grows hungrier than she was. She mates with any beast, and will mate with more before the greyhound comes to hunt her down. He will not feed on lands nor loot, but honor and love and wisdom will make straight his way. He will rise between Feltro and Feltro, and in him shall be the resurrection and the new day of that sad Italy for which Neasus died, and Turnius and Euralus and the maid Camilla he shall taunt her through every nation of sick pride till she is driven back forever to hell whence envy first released her on the world. Therefore, for your own good, I think it well you follow me and I be your guide and lead you forth through an eternal place. There you shall see the ancient spirits tried in endless pain and hear their lamentation in each bemoans the second death of souls. Next, you shall see upon a burning mountain souls in fire, yet content in fire, knowing that whensoever it may be, they will yet mount into the blessed choir. To which, if it is still your wish to climb, a worthier spirit shall be sent to guide you. With her I shall leave you, for the king of time who reigns on high forbids me to come there since, living, I rebelled against his law. He rules the waters and the land and the air, and there holds court, his city and his throne. O oh, blessed are they who he chooses. And I to him, poet, by that God to you unknown, lead me this way, beyond this present ill and worse to dread. Lead me to Peter's gate and guide me through the sad halls of hell. And he then followed and he moved ahead in silence, and I followed where he led. The light was departing. The brown air drew down all earth's creatures, calling them to rest from their day roving, as I, one man alone, prepared myself to face the double war of the journey and the pity 
which memory shall here set down, not hesitate, nor err. O oh, muses, O oh, high genius, be my aid. O oh, memory, recorder of the vision, here shall your true nobility be displayed. Thus I began. Poet, you who must guide me, before you trust me, to that arduous passage, look to me and look through me. Can I be worthy? You sang how the father of Silvius, while still incorruptible flesh, won to that other world, crossing with mortal sense the immortal sill. But if the adversary of all evil, weighing his consequence, and who and what should issue from him, treated him so well that cannot seem unfitting to thinking men, since he was the chosen father of Mother Rome, and of her empire of God's will and token, both, to speak strictly, were founded and foreknown as the established seat of holiness for the successors of great Peter's throne. In that quest, which your verses celebrate, he learned those mysteries from which arose his victory in Rome's apostolate. There later came the chosen vessel, Paul, bearing the confirmation of that faith, which is the one true door to life eternal. But I, how should I dare? By whose permission? I am not Aeneas. I am not Paul. Who could believe me worthy of the vision? How, then, may I presume to this high quest and not fear my own brashness? You are wise and will grasp what my poor words can but suggest. As one who unwills what he wills will stay strong purposes with feeble second thoughts until he spells all his first zeal away. So I hung back and balked on that dim coast, still thinking I had worn out my welcome, so stout at starting and so early lost. I understand from your words and the look in your eyes, that shadow of magnificence answered me. Your soul is sunken in that cowardice that bears down many men, turning their course and resolution by imagined perils, as his own shadow turns the frightened horse. To free you of this dread, I will tell you all of why I came to you and what I heard when I first pitied you. I was a soul among the souls of Limbo, when a lady so blessed and so beautiful, I prayed her to order and command my will, called to me. Her eyes were kindled from the lamps of heaven. Her voice reached through me, tender, sweet and low, an angel's voice a music of its own. O oh, gracious Manchuan, whose melodies live in earth's memory and shall live on till the last motion ceases in the skies, my dearest friend, and fortune's foe has strayed onto a friendless shore and stands beset by such distresses that he turns afraid from the true way. And news of him in heaven rumors my dread he is already lost. I come, afraid I am too late risen. Fly to him with your counsel, pity, and whatever need be for his good and soul's salvation, help him and solace me. It is I, Beatrice, who send you to him. I come from the blessed height for which I yearn. Love called me here. When amid Seferum, I stand before my Lord, your praises shall sound in heaven. She paused, and I began. O oh, lady of that only grace that raises feeble mankind within its mortal cycle, above all other works, God's will has placed within the heavens of the smallest circle. So welcome is your command, to my sense, were it already fulfilled, it would seem tardy. I understand and am all obedient. But tell me how you dare to venture so far from the wide heaven of your joy to which your thoughts yearn back from this abyss. Since what you ask, she answered me, probes near the root of all, 
I will say briefly only how I have come through hell's pit without fear. Know then, O oh waiting and compassionate soul, that is to fear, which has the power to harm, and nothing else is fearful even in hell. I am so made by God's all-seeing mercy, your anguish does not touch me, and the flame of this great burning has no power over me. There is a lady in heaven so concerned for him, I send to you that for her sake the strict decree is broken. She has turned and called Lucia to her wish and mercy, saying, Thy faithful one is sorely pressed in his distresses. I commend him to thee. Lucia, that soul of light and foe of all cruelty, rose and came to me at once where I was sitting with the ancient Rachel, who was saying to me, Beatrice, true praise of God, why dost thou not help him who loved thee so that for thy sake he left the vulgar crowd? Dost thou not hear his cries? Canst thou not see the death he wrestles with beside that river that no ocean can surpass for rage and fury? No soul on earth was ever as rapt to seek its good or flee its injury as I was. When I heard my sweet Lucia speak, to descend from heaven and my blessed seat to you, laying in my trust that high speech that honors you, and all who honor it. She spoke and turned away to hide a tear that, shining, urged me faster. So I came and freed you from the beast that drove you there, blocking the near way to the heavenly height. And now what ails you? Why do you lag? Why this heart-sick hesitation and pale fright, when three such blessed ladies lean from heaven in their concern for you, and my own pledge of the great good that waits you has been given? as flowerlets droop and puckered in the night, turn up to the returning sun and spread their petals wide on his new warmth and light. Just so my wilted spirits rose again, and such a heat of zeal surged through my veins that I was born anew. Thus I began, Blessed be that lady of infinite pity, and blessed be thy taxed and courteous spirit that came so promptly on the word she gave thee. Thy words have moved my heart to its first purpose. My guide, my lord, my master, now lead on. One will shall serve the two of us in this. He turned when I had spoken, and at his back I entered on that hard and perilous track. That was Canto 1 and 2 of The Inferno by Dante Alighieri. And I realize the first two may sound complex and not very interesting, but I feel exactly the same way. To me, the exciting things happen at the beginning of Canto 3, and that's where we are. They go up the path to the gates of hell. The first two cantos are explaining Dante and Virgil and the structure of hell and how things work, and what the rules are. And they have done that. Now, they're walking up the footpath to hell. And we'll take care of that next time, because this has been Dr. Peace Theater. And my name is Dr. Dennis Business. And as always, my friend.